Welcome to Ninja Orchids, established in 2018. First video went live in April of 2020. I secured the channel name because of several reasons. One, my name and middle initial is in the ninja. Two, as stated in my about section for those that do not know my name, I chose the name Ninja Orchids because orchids behave just like ninjas. They sneak up on you, they grow in stealth mode, and out of nowhere, they surprise you. And three, Ninja is an acronym for never in need, just ask. So, <laughs> when am I going to get to the point of talking about the care for my Dendrobium antenatum? Shortly. I promise, but I thought it was adequate to give you this little bit of background because me calling my channel Ninja Orchids and I do not have a Dendrobium Samurai? Yeah, that sucks. I tried. Now the little history lesson makes a little more sense, right? Okay, Dendrobium Samurai is not spelt the way as Samurai is, but phonetically close enough, and it would have served its purpose beautifully in my collection. Plus, of course, the channel name. By the way, I did buy a Dendrobium Samurai, but it turned out to be mislabeled and is instead a Lori Mortimer, so my only chance of having anything that came close to the Samurai was to grab this Antonatum while I could, because she's one of the parents to the Samurai, the Stratiotus being the other one, and the Samurai and the Antonatum are very, very similar in their appearance. The Samurai, however, has many, many more blooms and spikes than the Antonatum. It is a much larger orchid, and if you were to have a samurai in your collection, you're watching this video, would you let me know in the comments how large your samurai is and how many gazillion more spikes and blooms you get? Meanwhile, I'm very grateful to have an antenatum. Like I said, close enough. <laughs> I still have the samurai helmet look in the lip and the sepals, and we'll get to the antelope part a little bit later in this video. So now to the general care of this gorgeous Dendrobium antenatum, and I will tell you what I do, and we will see where the general care requirements overlap and where they don't. This will give you an idea as to how tolerant or not this orchid is for your conditions. Please take a moment to like this video. I would appreciate that very much. Also, if you've not subscribed to the channel, I sincerely hope that you do. Thank you so much for that as well. Right, into the meat and bones of this video. Antonatum is also commonly known as the antelope dendrobium. It is a species, which is glorious when you think that species could be fussy. I'm getting ahead of myself but it originates from various parts of Southeast Asia and Northern Australia. Being that this orchid is being grown in Southern Spain, let's start with light. The general care states to provide bright filtered light. These orchids typically enjoy moderate to high light levels. However, avoid direct sun, especially during the hottest part of the day as it can scorch the leaves. Keep that sentence in mind. It will become relevant just now. A location with bright indirect sunlight or dappled sunlight is ideal. Now, in my climate, the sun is strong and so is the ambient air for approximately three months of the year from June through August. Where this orchid lives during the months of April through to mid-November, she gets direct afternoon sun during the months of June through August and I do not have a single scorched leaf. I find that many dendrobiums with the light green leaves can really handle direct sun without any issues. While I do have airflow around the orchid, the breeze is not any cooler either, so the cool down of the leaves is not something that happens in those conditions. On some really, really blisteringly hot days, in duck feet hot because that's all relative, but on some really hot days, I do go and check my leaves, and lo and behold, they feel cooler to the touch than the ambient surroundings do. It is quite astounding how much light this orchid can tolerate without burning the leaves. So if you're babying your antenatum or your samurai, be a little bit more bold. They can really handle the direct sun. And because of this high light requirement during the winter months, she has pride of place at the brightest spot right by the glass pane of the sliding door of the indoor grow space to get the maximum amount of light that the winter provides based on weather, not because I use supplemental lighting. 
Well, we've just spoken about winter, so let's check the general care for this orchid when it comes to temperatures and then see what matches and what doesn't when it comes to my conditions. This orchid appreciates a warm to intermediate climate, especially during the growing season, which is typically from spring to fall. The day temperatures should be around 24 to 29 degrees Celsius, and the nighttime temperatures can drop slightly but should stay above 13 degrees Celsius. So these temperature levels actually match what I have in my climate during the warmer months of the year. Sometimes my temperatures can reach 40 degrees Celsius. Then I will pull the orchid from the direct sun location she is in, put her in shade, but those temperatures are super rare. Still, what is important for many growers is to know what the low temperatures are and what can this orchid tolerate. So I have not gone lower than 14 degrees Celsius in my orchid winter holding space. I hope I don't have to ever experience lower temperatures than that indoors, but she's holding up really well, even when the days don't warm up enough to counterbalance the cold. I will address my setup in a moment because I strongly believe that my setup has something to do with the fact that she does not dump her roots during during the cold months of the year. And when I mention I don't want it to get any colder than that, that's not just because of the orchid. That is because I don't use heating in my home during the winter and uh, brr, 14 degrees Celsius is cold enough for me. Thank you very much. Now, moving on, let's elaborate a little bit on the humidity requirements and ha, maintain higher humidity levels for this orchid around 50 to 70 percent. And in my conditions, <laughs> that is not something I'm able to provide for for the first two years that she has been in my collection. My humidity levels usually hover around 30 percent and they can drop to 12. And on the wonderful occasions, they can reach 85 percent. So I always generalize my humidity levels as a mean of 30% throughout the year. This orchid has shown me that if you cannot accommodate the preferred humidity levels, then don't worry, she won't be stressed out for the lack thereof. Just so happens in 2023, I have had humidity levels. Whew, it took me back to my childhood in Kenya. Fantastic, but very unusual and not something I would rely on. So with the lack of humidity, we go into the watering requirements that can vary depending on the specific conditions of your growing environment. Ideally, allowing the potting media to dry slightly between waterings if you're growing in a wet, dry culture. During the active growing season, water more frequently. Keeping the roots moist but not waterlogged as per any epiphyte in a wet, dry cycle. And then the general care also says that in the dormant period, which usually occurs in winter, to reduce watering while ensuring that the canes do not shrivel. In my experience, this orchid does not go dormant during the winter. In my environment, she starts her new growths during the winter. And while the progress of the growth is a little slow at the start, there are many of them and they need to be provided for. So keep in mind, if you're looking general care wise, uh, dormant, this orchid doesn't go dormant. She may rest in between flowering and starting new growths. And that is when you can reduce watering a little bit, but there is no dormancy, so I wanted to correct that just in case you heard about it with the antenatum. Personally, I highly recommend that the activity of this orchid is your tell as to when to water and fertilize. Now, when it comes to what is the ideal setup for the orchid, if you grow in organic media, then make sure that you use a well-draining potting mix that allows the roots to dry out between waterings. Again, not for too long. If she is in active growth, ideally you want to use a mix of coarse bark, perlite and sphagnum moss. A combination of the three will provide good drainage while retaining some moisture. The water retention is important unless you have time to water your orchid several times a day when she is in active growth. This orchid is thirsty when she's in active growth. For that reason, as well as to buffer against my low humidity, I have her in lava rock only, but in a self-watering setup. My lava rock pieces are approximately three centimeters, so I would consider that chunky lava rock. And it has so many porous nooks and crannies that it allows for airflow, gas exchange, and oxygen around the roots while still being potted up in a closed pot. This orchid is not shy of growing roots, and in this setup, I can control how damp or dry the roots are during the colder months of the year. 
Antelope type dendrobiums, as a general rule, do not appreciate wet roots with cold temperatures. <laughs> Who would like wet feet with cold temperatures? So lava rock works perfectly. It does not have the threat of evaporative cooling that Lekka has, but if you grow in a controlled environment and are able to use heat mats to counteract any cooling down of the media, then this orchid will absolutely love Lekka as well. Clearly, I'm not using heat mats, otherwise she would be in Lekka. As mentioned earlier, this orchid grows a lot of new growths once established and all of them are vying for nutrients. So the general care suggests that you fertilize this orchid every two to four weeks when in active growth. Well, I highly recommend that you fertilize every time your pot goes dry. In my case, I fertilize every time the reservoir has been absorbed. But prior to doing that, I flush the pot through with plain RO water to make sure that there is no salt accumulation in the pot. Meanwhile, depending on the maturity of the orchid you have, this orchid is not only thirsty, but it is hungry as well. So while I am cautious during the cooler months of the year, and start out tentatively at 200 parts per million of fertilizer as soon as the day lengths increase and temperatures rise, I up the concentration to 500 parts per million and I don't have salt buildup. This means, as a matter of fact, that I could potentially up the PPM even further, but I'm okay with the size of my growths and the spike count, the color of the leaves, there is no sign of deficiency, so I'm not going to poke the bear and risk getting any salt buildup. For now, 500 parts per million of a balanced orchid-specific fertilizer is doing the job. There is no need to go overboard. I do supplement with CalMag three months prior to heading indoors, which is mid-November when we start to move things indoors. This will help the orchid deal with stressful conditions which are bound to come her way. I continue with CalMag at a parts per million of 200 throughout the winter months as well just to make sure that she has the protection throughout the stressful conditions. So this is what the whole regime looks like for my Dendrobium antenatum. Focusing on the 500 parts per million of fertilizer when temperatures are ideal, and then during the winter alternating between CalMag and 200 parts per million of fertilizer once the reservoir is absorbed and only when in active growth, which she is during the winter months <laughs> so that we can get this beautiful blooming bang smack in the middle of the most beautiful months of the year. <laughs> Speaking of blooming, my 2023 blooming produced 18 spikes, and I'm so happy with the visual of each and every single bloom, including the seed pods. I observed the deed when the wasp came and had a goo, <laughs> attracted by the delicious fragrance this orchid has. Last I counted, I had six seed pods, and while that would be a shame if the orchid only had a limited bloom count, as you can see, who cares? <laughs> Minus six blooms out of all this abundance, it was fun to see which bloom would produce a seed pod because that pollinator was busy. It really looked like it had struck gold. It was all by its lonesome with all this gorgeous orchid and, well, the fragrance is intense. Even while the orchid is outdoors, it has a well-balanced fragrance of honeysuckle, heavier on the sweet honey note, than something like molasses, but it also comes with a powdery note that makes the orchid pleasant to have around. It's not like some orchids that may be headache inducing. I love the fragrance and because the blooms last at least eight weeks, that fragrance is around for a long time. It's just wonderful. A personal anecdote when it comes to the blooms. This being an antelope type dendrobium for obvious reasons, the sepals standing bolt upright with a bit of a curl is the clue that gave these kinds of dendrobiums the antelope type description. This beautiful detail reminds me of home. Kenya with all the antelope horns showing above the grasses of the savanna while on safari. When I see this orchid in bloom and the sepals peeking out from all the spikes, it's a stretch, but not that much of a stretch that I need to pull a mental muscle, but I see those antelope horns 
and see the tall grasses hiding and protecting the animal from predators. It's such a gorgeous visual. With such a delicious fragrance though come pests. And no, I don't consider pollinator pests, but this orchid is a mealy bug magnet, especially while growing new growth. It produces a lot of happy sap. Again, during the months of the year that are cooler, it would appear that mealy bugs' lives matter and they find my antenatum. So I have to be super vigilant in the eventuality that they are around. The dense growth habit of this orchid can cause an infestation to break out very quickly because they are not easy to spot at first. I have my garlic alcohol very close at hand when new growth start and then they start to leaf out. It is not enough to just have a quick once over on this orchid and consider her pest free. I highly recommend to actually inspect the orchid every time because it can be that there's nothing to see today and suddenly the classic out of nowhere comes into effect. The mealies love this orchid but thankfully mealies are easily dealt with so if that is all this orchid attracts I will choose mealies before any other pest because with them the adult of here today and gone tomorrow does apply. Just don't lean on the laurels of gone tomorrow. Keep checking, keep inspecting, and there will be absolutely no risk of infestation. I love me species orchids like these, and being a species you would think that this orchid has quirks that may make it difficult to grow and bloom. Well, the fact that it can do what it does with the limited pampering it gets for four months of the year in my climate. Imagine the potential of this orchid given the 24-7, 365 days a year pampering TLC that a controlled environment would provide. Ooh, <laughs> the potential. <laughs> I love species orchids that don't have the diva gene in them. <laughs> the way this orchid grows and blooms, you would think it is a hybrid because this is why orchids get hybridized, to make them less needy of special conditions, but maximize vigor and blooms. Dendrobium antenatum has all those attributes, but in a species. And me thoughts <laughs> that this deserved a special video and I hope that you agree and enjoyed it. And maybe it gave you a hint, hint, nudge, nudge to possibly look into getting an antenatum for yourself or maybe a samurai. Either way, let me know in the comments. And hopefully if you have one and it hasn't been performing well for you, I hope that this video will change that in the coming months. And then you have this beautiful spectacle to enjoy. I thoroughly enjoyed filming this video. I got a bit distracted because of, you know, antelopes, Kenya, savannah, horns peeking out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Your time is appreciated. Know that I wish you a fabulous day. However, there is a condition attached to that, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.